Welcome to the start of the Green Book Fair. Uh, so the Green Book Fair is an initiative by the Northern Fiction Alliance based in the UK. The Northern Fiction Alliance is 30 publishers who work together to really um, show the uh, strength of publishing in the North um, and band together because publishing can be very London centric in the UK. Um, also, what we're aiming to do with the Green Book Fair is to do business online and really eliminate the need to be traveling to places like Frankfurt, uh, Bologna, really carbon intensive trips, which perhaps we do not need in the publishing industry when we're wanting to work with international publishers um, and sell rights, um, do uh, co-editions and things like that. And so the hope is that we're going to network this week, we're going to make new connections um, and we're going to learn about fantastic books all across the globe. Um, we wanted to kick off um, by offering you a panel and something which is going to make publishers think about perhaps the responsibility we have in terms of how we are communicating narratives about around climate change and the discourse. Um, so I had a fantastic conversation with Adam Cooper, who is from New Writing North. Um, he's running an initiative called Threads in the Ground, um, which is all about finding new narratives for climate change um, and perhaps more positive stories. And perhaps if we have more positive stories, are we going to feel more positive about banding together for climate change? Um, are we working with the community? communities um, which are doing really interesting things are we showing the community stories um or as adam is probably going to talk about later are we sort of perpetuating pr campaigns that were sort of invented by gas companies um and i'm sure adam will talk a little bit about um, his work there and um, we're also joined by Sarah France, um, whose research entirely specialises in eco-narratives um, and she has a real idea of what kind of stories are out there around climate change. Um, something that the Green Book Fair is really looking to do is to see how responsible we are as publishers. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing Adam and Sarah discuss these things. Okay, hi everyone. I'm just going to share the uh, PowerPoint now. You see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's working. Great. Um, shall I kick off, Sarah? Yeah, go ahead. Brilliant. Uh, it's lovely to to see the list of names of everybody who's here, and and thanks for the lovely introduction as well. So um, my name's Adam. I'm uh, a director of Threads in the Ground, we're a new climate hope charity. It's been co-founded by New Writing North. Um, which I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And um, so our work is all about unearthing um, powerful climate stories, helping more people to be good ancestors. Um, so we're going to unpack a few of the ideas behind the organization through, through the presentation. Um, Sarah? Sorry, I had myself on mute there. Um, yeah, my name's Sarah. I'm uh, just finishing up a PhD at Newcastle University, um, kind of focusing on eco-narratives. Um, I'm very much interested in the work that Adam's doing and interested in uh, how we try to narrate uh, climate catastrophe and try to create stories that really engage with um, our responsibility to and our connection with the natural world. So publishing beyond dystopia, um, the first thing to say, you all, you are all the experts that what Sarah and I want to do is introduce some interesting ideas, some some uh, to hopefully inspire some different kinds of thinking about how we select and develop new texts. So we're going to introduce a bit of the um, the background history and and ac academic framework for understanding dystopia and utopia and and um, those different sort of genres and subgenres, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some emerging um, climate change psychology stuff, um, and look at how those two worlds come together. So, shall we crack on? Okay, so as Adam said, we wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the the concept of of utopia. Um, so, where the term originated, the kind of offshoot genres that it's inspired. Uh, and then thinking about these genres in relation to the question of narrating climate catastrophe. So a utopia is usually some kind of um, vision or imagining of a, of a perfect world. Uh, so whether that's socially, politically, uh, economically, environmentally, or usually a blend of all of the above. 
The term was popularized by Thomas More's 1516 novel, uh, Utopia, uh, which is about an imagined ideal island, this kind of self-contained community, um, which is this like vision of an ideal world. And the term Utopia, it, it, it stems from the Greek utopos, uh, which means no place um, or nowhere. Uh, and that in turn is playing on the Greek word utopos, which means a good place. So there's already kind of inherent in the name uh, this question of whether an ideal world can actually exist. Um, there's a, a kind of almost element of irony, right? And and some utopian novels contain a degree of satire, uh, questioning the attainability of, of a true utopos. So here are some other novels which draw on this idea of a perfect world. We've got uh, Herland by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which was um, uh, published in 1915. It's a feminist utopian novel um, that envisions a isolated society of women who can procreate independently. Uh, there's also Men Like Gods uh, by H.G. Wells. Uh, this came out in 1923 and the protagonist is transported to a parallel world. Um, it's kind of like th maybe like 3000 years or so ahead of humanity and it has achieved many scientific, political and social advancements. So um, with utopias, you often see authors critiquing to or alluding to certain socioeconomic problems through their construction of the utopia. So with Herland, there's a lot of um, engagement with questions of uh, genre, uh, gender and equality. Um, so there's this kind of vision of uh, women's freedom and, and rights in response to women's lack thereof in reality. All the utopias generally differ in how the utopia Hello. itself... Hello. Um, they usually differ in how the utopia is constructed, um, but there's generally an emphasis on a world that is very, very different to our own and also kind of separate from our own. Uh, so whether that's the isolated island, the alternate universe that's traveled to, or a very kind of far future imagining. Um, and there's often this like complete overhaul of structures and systems. So what's become um, a bit more common now is the dystopia, um, which is kind of this like dark opposite to the utopia with the dis meaning the bad, so like a bad place. Uh, and again, this often envisions a world that's very different to our own. Um, it can be far future, it can be otherworldly, uh, might be isolated, but they often do um, extrapolate on current fears. So kind of taking our current fears um, and anxieties about our own world to the extreme. Um, sometimes it might be a utopia gone wrong, so attempts to make the perfect world failed pretty pretty disastrously. Um, and there's often strong themes of government control and societal decline, um, which may be paired with elements of technological disasters. So like that kind of black mirror, um, technology gone too far or technology gone wrong uh, or indeed environmental disasters. Um, we've got some examples here. So the kind of classic like government control in 1984. Uh, there's the reproductive control of the Handmaid's Tale. Um, uh, this colony, uh, the Hunger Games, Fahrenheit 451, the colony which uh, draws on that utopian isolation uh, gone wrong. Um, uh, yeah. And then we're moving on to the post-apocalyptic. Um, so this is the kind of similar overlapping genre within um, these post-apocalyptic narratives. They're usually before or after an apocalyptic end of the world type event. Sometimes there's a bit of crossover with like they're also kind of dystopic as well. Um, the apocalyptic event, it, it can really be anything. Um, so nuclear warfare, uh, climate change, extraterrestrial asteroids, zombies. Um, and they're often, again, reflective of societal anxieties. Uh, the focus is generally on the event itself, the collapse of society, um, and then on uh, surviving and rebuilding in the after. And again, there's often this focus on uh, individual exceptionalism and survival, so like a kind of small group of people who are able to persist after the event. Um, and again, we've got some examples here, um, The Road, The Stand, Bird Box, um, which became quite popular, um, which were also adapted into uh, popular TV series or films. So we want to think about these genres when it comes to the question of narrating climate catastrophe. 
these genres are incredibly popular and, and many, as I've said, have been adapted into really successful films or TV series. And when thinking about narrating climate catastrophe, um, there can be a bit of an impulse to turn to those genres. And indeed, they can really be um, a fascinating way to explore or reflect current societal anxieties. But what we're interested in thinking about is uh, whether there are other ways to explore climate catastrophe without envisioning a futuristic, potentially unattainable world, um, without envisioning a uh, kind of nihilistic, very depressing worst case scenario, uh, and without positioning uh, climate catastrophe as this singular disaster that people can uh, wait out if they're exceptionally good at surviving in the post-apocalypse. In dramas such as the dystopia or the post-apocalypse, uh, the, narr the narrative focus is often primarily on the human story as well. So it's this like anthropocentric response to the disaster and to the collapse. And what we're interested in looking through today is turning to the stories that instead shift away from anthropocentrism, uh, to stories that explore the reality of climate catastrophe, our responsibility to the material world, and indeed our entanglement within it. Thanks, Sarah. So, from uh, from a climate change psychology standpoint, why why is it important for for us working in in publishing and writing? Why is it important for us, in particular, to explore these ideas? So, oh, so you've got control on the next one. Thank you. Um, so, I love this quote from the the brilliant Margaret Atwood. It's not climate change; it's everything change. And for me, this quote sums up so much the fact that um, every global and local system that we can, that you can think of so um societal economic te technological um natural every every system is is inextricably linked and entangled with climate change and the biodiversity crises that every everything is complex and everything is interlinked um so next slide sarah um and it's because of this because of this complexity we can't address climate change in in, in silos. Uh, we can't address it with, there are no silver bullet simple solutions. There are only complex long-term um, iterative solutions. So uh, following on from the Atwood quote, I love this one from Gutierrez, uh, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. So next slide. So we know that the next millennium of the Earth's climate will be determined by how much we can limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss in the next 100 years. So in the, ne the next millennium is dictated by this century. And there is general scientific consensus that the next century of, um, of emission reductions and biodiversity protection will be determined by the system changes and policy changes that you and I can help to make in the next five to 10 years. So, um, so the next five, 10 years of system change and, pol and policy change dictate how billions and trillions of, hum of the humans that come after us will live. So from that, we can make the argument that you and I are the most powerful generation of humans that will ever exist. There's estimates there'll be about 300 trillion humans will ever live. We've had about 300,000 years of human history up to now. And by chance, you and I live in this in this moment, in this window, when the actions that we take, the work that we do, will echo throughout. So that can be an incredibly overwhelming idea and a squashing idea, or we can we, we can choose to honor that privilege and to to acknowledge that incredible power that we have and we can ask the question what then is the most powerful thing that i with my expertise and my and my, and my unique working life uh what's the most powerful action that i can take so next <clears throat> so we know a lot more now about what works in climate comms than um than we than we have done in the last few decades obviously it's an obvious statement to make but true um we know that um, we need diversity of climate communication that we can't scare people into action. Um, we know that people need to have um, a baseline of climate literacy uh, to be able to take effective action. And they need to feel that the communities around them will do the same. Um, and they need to have a sense of hope. 
But the reality is that 75% of adults, um, the, the uh, certainly in the UK, 75%, and it kind of rounds out about 75% globally, of adults think that the future is frightening, that over half of children and young people feel sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, guilty. So it's like this word cloud of emotions that you don't want for solving complex challenges like climate change. And that's because the scale and the complexity are overwhelming. It's not climate change, it's everything change. So this chart over to the left here, this is um, Plachik's wheel of emotions. It's one, it's one model, one framework for understanding human emotion. Um, so there's the eight core emotions um, at the center, which are like the most intense uh, expression of those emotions, and then we move further out. And uh, I, uh, so I don't have data to back this, but I feel that a lot, um, that the majority of climate themed or climate inspired uh, work being published sits in this kind of anger, disgust, sadness, um, not quadrant, you know, uh, fr uh, fraction of the wheel. And that a lot of our public storytelling sits in those places as well. When I'm doing public events and and talking to people, um, and at talks, the the emotional the the emotional color sits in those places, and we are we are missing out on this whole spectrum, or this other spectrum of emotion, which is e equally and differently able to motivate action and motivate new ways of thinking. So how can we as as storytellers um, help ourselves and others to access this broader emotional set? So next slide, Sarah. Um, so a slight a slight sidestep. So we talked about being the most powerful generation of humans that there will ever be. So what what a fantastic tool to have um, to be able to understand the individual impact that each of us has in the world so our our carbon footprint so this tool the know your carbon footprint tool was um released in i think 2002 and it's brilliant because you, you can go online and I can, I can calculate the exact impact that i personally am having on the world and start to reduce that but if you just click sarah um what we don't talk about enough is that the very the concept of carbon footprint the language of carbon footprint was created by bp as a deliberate global PR campaign to shift responsibility onto individuals, onto us. So if you think on that previous slide, that that emotion wheel, that sense of hopelessness, powerlessness, guilt, you know, that that weight, that weight of emotion that heaves us down, that's been done to us, that's been put on us as, as a del deliberate um, strategy to shift responsibility onto individuals and away from large international interests. And I, I'm i not sharing that as like personal, like as a con personal conspiracy theory type thing. This is a well-documented um, thing. Uh, this is in public record. There's, there's multiple BBC documentaries about that this has happened. And this is one of the reasons why our climate discourse is dominated by um, like dystopian narrative and that sense of hopelessness and powerlessness. So um, yeah, next one, thanks. So we, we want to make the argument to you that our role working in this sector, so our role as publishers, as writers, is far more than just reducing the direct impact of our buildings and our productions and our processes and, and, and all the rest. That reducing our impact is important, but we must do more then our, our thinking must be more than thinking about how can we make ourselves smaller in this space. We're talking about global renaissance is what is required, a global renaissance of systems and society, and that requires expansiveness and outward thinking and interconnectedness. So um, that is the greatest challenge of storytelling that our species has ever faced. So I would argue that that is our role, that is your role in this moment, is this storytelling. So next one, Sarah, I think it's over to you. Yeah. Okay, so we're kind of um, returning back to this idea of utopia then, but we're thinking about, you know, rather than envisioning this far future utopia um, where 
maybe it feels a little bit unattainable to have like such a complete overhaul as is seen in some of those utopian narratives. Um, what we're interested today in talking about is is how maybe narratives which embody utopian thinking, um, so this kind of thinking through um, to, in terms of kind of improvement or positivity um, or shifting mindset, how that might indeed shift our perspectives towards the environment now. So rather than thinking, okay, well, there might be like a utopian vision thousands of years in the future or in an alternative universe, how can this utopian thinking help us through um, thinking our relationship to the material world in the now? Um, and so we've got some examples of uh, what this might include, uh, and we'll go through each of these in turn. So first up, we've got uh, non-anthropocentrism, which is kind of uh, a little bit of an umbrella term um, that is going to cover a lot of the texts that we'll look at today. Uh, and so these texts generally refuse a sense of anthropocentrism. Uh, by anthropocentrism, what I mean is this perspective that centers and privileges humanity beyond all other beings. Um, it's this presumption that that humans are separate from and superior to the natural non-human world. Um, and it kind of refuses to acknowledge that we are very much dependent on um, and connected with uh, other species and that natural uh, material world. Uh, so texts which explore non-anthropocentrism generally make an attempt to shift away from anthropocentric perspectives. So um, trying not to think of humanity as being the only protagonist um, or understanding that the uh, material world is not simply a backdrop to the human stories. And we've got a quote from uh, Alexandra Kleeman here, um, who's uh, something new under the sun I'll be talking about momentarily. Uh, she says, when we widen the view of a narrative, how does that decenter the human? How does that allow us to see our position more accurately in a world that is shifting and changing much faster than we realize? So when we're thinking about climate catastrophe, thinking beyond the perspective of the human can be helpful in understanding the far reaching and um, irreversible uh, damages that are being made um, and thinking through the impact on other species and, and thinking uh, about the impact beyond our own individual lifetimes. And decentering the human can also be helpful in uh, not seeing humanity as the top of like a kind of chain of importance um, and, and not thinking humanity as being separate from uh, the rest of the world, which is often then positioned as, as lesser. So an example of this non-anthropocentrism in practice can appear through uh, considering non-human perspectives. Uh, through having a purely non-human narrator or experimenting with including non-human perspectives within the wider story. Uh, I've got a couple examples here of um, Todd, which has uh, the perspectives of um, dolphins and numerous sea creatures, it's got, uh, multiple POVs, um, and Henry Hope's Open Throat, which I'm really excited to read this. Um, it uh, takes the perspective of a mountain lion living in Hollywood and it explores questions of climate catastrophe and climate grief from the perspective of the, the mountain lion. So these kind of um, non-human perspectives can encourage readers to think outside of the human framework. Um, it can help place us within the unfamiliar perspective of the non-human. It allows us not to presume humanity as the central subject and the um, only possible perspective that we can have uh, and encourages a broader consideration of who or what might be perceived as a potential protagonist. This can provoke a challenge to presumptions surrounding um, things like subjectivity and value. Uh, so the question of whose story is worth telling. And it also can be helpful to think from other mindsets. So thinking about, well, maybe how do our actions impact other beings? We have experimentation with genre. So this might be through uh, subverting genre expectations and critiquing certain prevalent tropes uh, or genre hybridity. Uh, with tropes, uh, that might be like an awareness of tropes that um, uh, potentially quite dominant in other genres, but maybe aren't quite appropriate in thinking through climate catastrophe. Um, so the example I always think of is uh, like dis certain disaster movies such as Armageddon. So that's the one where um, there's the asteroid and Bruce Willis and his team of drillers are able to train to be astronauts in like three weeks. 
um and they're they're sent up to the asteroid i think they they kind of bury like they drill a nuclear bomb and and the asteroid is exploded and they save the world um so that kind of almost techno utopian individual heroism is potentially not quite appropriate when we're thinking through the collective responsibility and action needed to respond to climate change and sometimes um texts which like allude to and critique those tropes um might do so to basically draw draw attention to that um so if anyone watched Don't Look Up, the uh, film that came out, I think last year, a couple of years ago, um, which was uh, also an asteroid, but it was very much engaging with questions of climate change and responding to climate change. Uh, Don't Look Up satirized a lot of these tropes. Um, so there is this scene where it's revealed that they could stop the asteroid remotely, um, but Hollywood needs a hero. So they send someone up like in, in a to, to kind of explode the to try and blow up the asteroid uh, so it's just that kind of allusion to this need for an individual hero rather than you know that collective um action that is needed um so yeah blending genres or subverting generic frameworks uh so for example here we've got something new under the sun so this is a mystery story that's set amidst the backdrop of environmental collapse um, and so crime fiction, mystery fiction, it often has certain expectations. Um, but with this novel, there's, a, try not to spoil it too much, but there is kind of a very much lack of resolution and a shift away from the expected steps of the genre. Um, there's a quote that I have here from um, a reviewer, Matthew Schneier, who said, Kleeman seems to lose interest in the mystery scheme by the end, which only makes sense. Solving crimes against the environment doesn't obviate crimes against the environment, and the novel hurtles toward a dissolution that feels both unsatisfying and apt. So with this novel, then, we kind of see the collapse of the environment mirrored in the collapse of genres. Experimentation with form and structure. So this might take the form of nonlinearity, which can be a really interesting way to evidence the impact of climate change. So if you have like one timeline in the present um, and you see the effects of that timeline in the far future, um, scales beyond the human. Uh, so not just thinking in, in singular human lifetime scales, but um, perhaps theological scales, um, thinking beyond human existence, um, like before or after we were around, um, or just gen generally um, thinking through experimental structures. Uh, so our examples here, we have Appleseed by Matt Bell. Uh, which is non-linear and it has three interweaving timelines. And this is a, a very clear example of uh, ways in which non-linearity can allow us to see how the actions have uh, far future impacts. So um, in Appleseed, you have like often evidences of, of certain kind of perspectives of human dominance um, and authority over the land, um, resulting in climate catastrophe in the present and future timelines. Um, Archive of Alternate Endings, such a fascinating novel. Um, it's a non-linear exploration of several storylines from the 1300s to around about 2300. Um, and it uses a comet, a comet as a narrative structure. So each narrative is um, temporarily located at the time when the comet passes by the Earth. Um, so that's a really fascinating use of structure there, um, and it very much considers long scale impact of human action. Obviously, over like such an extended period of time, you kind of see the the shift in the the environment and the earth. Um, you're considering the planetary perspective, so um, it often considers the planet, uh, the comet itself, as a character, um, following the journey of that comet, uh, and it considers a world beyond the human. So one of the chapters is just a blank page that depicts the eventual collision between the comet and the Earth in the very far future. Uh, so another example of this is um, The Overstory by Richard Powers. So this follows multiple characters uh, and their relationship with trees and their work to prevent the destruction of forests. Uh, now, Sha Shannon Lambert has actually argued that the structure of the novel itself mirrors the arboreal networks of trees and their um, underground connectivity. She argues that 
through the novel's use of multiple narration, uh, lack of separation through the characters and repetition of phrases, ideas and references, the characters are woven together to create a sense of intraspecies collectivity between both each other and the trees themselves. So you've got this um, structural experimentation, which really emphasizes the entanglement of humanity with the material world itself. So um, it brings us to the idea of this human, non-human entanglement. Um, and I love the I love the quote. Um, All models are wrong. Some are useful. And our our model for understanding kind of taxonomy and how species um, and separating species, that's not like an absolute natural law. That's just our current um, societal understanding of how um, ecosystems and and species work the 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 reality is is some kind of incredibly complex incomprehensible entanglement of life and uh, we, we absolutely love Merlin Sheldrick's um, writing in his book Entangled Life and particularly this quote that we are ecosystems that span boundaries and trans transgress categories ourselves emerge from a complex tangle of relationships only now becoming known and you would argue that, that we will be for all, forever and always um, coming to know some of those complex relationships, that there is no solving them and there's no kind of final model for understanding life. We are fully entangled with the ecosystems around us and being able to explore that entanglement and the and the, those kind of permeable and false boundaries between, between life, that that's uh, an incredibly powerful um, idea. It draws a bit more on what Sarah was talking about earlier of, of um, uh, anthro anthropocentrism, uh, positioning humans as separate and above the natural world, whereas we are as entangled in it as any as any fungus um, and inter interdependent. Um, yeah, next one. I think it's you, Sarah. Yeah, and so a kind of. Similarly, drawing on uh, this last slide, the human non human entanglement, um, we've also got an, ex an example of braiding sweetgrass here by Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, who's an um, Indigenous uh, scientist who very much draws on her kind of um, knowledge in thinking about the reciprocal relationship we have and should be aware of with the environment. Um, there's a great quote here action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting as we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So it's that kind of, you know, we're not separate from the earth, you know, trying to think about ways in which we um, consider and, and, and help fix the environment isn't just thinking about the environment, it's thinking about everything. Um, and then we also see how uh, these ideas can be explored through various genre fiction, um, such as fantasy, such as the fifth season. Adam, did you want to run over this one? Um, I think we were going to do this one sort of together. Yeah, so, so we, do you want to go yeah. through the story? Yeah, so we both absolutely love um, N.K. Jemison's work. So this is uh, the fifth season's part of a trilogy. I think every one of the books won the Hugo Award and... The first two had kind of a clean sweep of the sci of of the major sci-fi awards, which I think was the first. I think is the first trilogy to do that. Um, so it's a it's an incredible story. It follows um, the main the main character, the central character is a, is a woman, is a black woman, uh, living in a in a sort of alternate. Um, in an alternate world where there is, there are individual humans that are able to sort of control the earth or they have a, they have a they have like a connection to the earth and to the ground and they're able to to um, to control and move that so it's um but the earth is also um there are huge natural 
disasters and catastrophes that the earth is almost um trying to remove humans from this from the surface so it's this story of um this kind of approaching approaching apocalypse but told in a very different um framed in a very different way to any other apocalyptic uh narrative that i've ever that i've ever read um and it, yeah explores um the sort of human relationships with the with the earth and the sort of kind of Gaian ideas kind of woven through it as well um yeah what would, what would you what would you add Sarah yeah thanks Adam yeah and and we've got some really interesting work that's being done on this novel um so Caroline Edwards uh, argues that this human connection with stone that is envisioned in the fifth season uh, can be seen as this hopeful form of elemental utopian possibility um, and she uses the term human lithic encounters, lithic meaning uh, related to stone. Um, she says, she argues that these human lithic encounters remind us of our connection with the world um, and they encourage a perspectival and ethical shift that is urgently required at a time of climate emergency. Um, and indeed, thinking through rocks can be particularly helpful in thinking in deep time, um, the kind of thinking that's required when thinking about uh, the far ranging consequences of climate catastrophe. Um, so thinking in a geological time, right, thinking about the Anthropocene, about the humans being this like strata in, in the earth and our impact on the earth that is so expansive that it, it's caused, it could cause like literal um, uh, impact on on that that geological strata so thinking beyond the um, human framework of temporality right and we've got the quote from Jeffrey Jerome Cohen here who says that thinking lithically requires a leap from ephemeral stabilities from the diminutive boundedness of merely human tales and so um, as Adam was saying it's kind of worth mentioning here that what we're not saying that this is an either or it's not like we're saying you know either apocalypse or dystopian narratives or these narratives there are apocalyptic narratives that can and indeed do explore these uh, these ideas so this is some fan art for the becky chambers wayfarer series um to get another incredibly popular um sci-fi series um which has a has a very different sort of tone to, um, to I suppose the other mainstream sci-fi, uh, and one of one of the ideas woven through the series is this idea of interspecies collaboration, and if you read them, in in some ways you could argue that all of the all of the alien species in the books are just variations of humans um and you know almost almost humans in alien costumes the way that the way that their communication and society work but there are dif there are differences there and it's they're incredibly popular texts that are exploring those ideas of kind of tension and collaboration between between species and um we're sure that there are a lot more interesting um texts that that explore those ideas further whether that's in sci-fi or or um in other settings and it builds more on those ideas before of moving away from anthropocentric um narrative and embracing um kind of entanglement um uh, kind of ecological entanglement the what what are what are the stories that start to in, unpack or popularize these these ideas of of collaboration across um species species boundary if that makes sense um yeah so that's with her okay so we, we've gone over a few ideas today um we do just want to clarify some things that we're not saying um so we're not saying that we want anyone to write or publish a particular way um nor are we saying that a dystopian or apocalyptic fiction is bad or that it, it shouldn't be done um, we're not saying that everybody should be only writing, publishing uh, climate fiction, um, nor are we saying that all texts that um, come out should be kind of that specific, hopeful climate action oriented. But what we are saying is that a global renaissance is happening, that you and I will live through a renaissance of global systems and thinking and, and ideas of what it is to be human. Um, and that shift and how we go through that shift is a storytelling challenge, is possibly the greatest story ch storytelling challenge a species will ever 
go through. And we, you and I, were professional storytellers and working in storytelling. Um, so we are part of that that special generation. Um, and historians will say that most generations will argue that they are special, but we've we've probably got the strongest case so far to make that argument. Um, what we are also seeing is that there is a vast kind of underexplored um, creative fertile ground as publishers for, for us to explore here, um, that we, we should be exploring these ideas because that's where the innovation can be in, um, in new texts. We're also saying that we need that diversity of thought and creative exploration. So, um, and I feel there's a bit of a homogeneity at the moment in kind of public storytelling around around climate change, and we need more of the kind of texts that we've um, highlighted today. Um, and we're saying that these are just some interesting starting points. So this is just the stuff that Sarah and I are interested in, um, and we would we'd love to hear from you about additional ideas or how you'd like to carry these ideas forward. So um, thinking of time, Sarah, what do you reckon, Sarah? Do we do do we do breakout or Q&A? What are you feeling? Oh. I think we're I think we said we'd need 20 minutes for a breakout. So maybe we should just do Q&A. I'm happy with yeah. that. Cool. So what well, what we're going to do is open open the floor to to you guys. So we're gonna have, we're gonna pause. I'm gonna time you for sixty seconds, just to allow allow you this stuff to percolate, and for you to to um to articulate some ideas for yourself. So the question that we want to pose to you is, which of these ideas are you drawn to, and how might you apply them? And we're gonna give you sixty seconds to to explore that, to maybe write your notes, and then we're gonna open up the floor to questions. Um, we had hoped we might have time to do kind of breakout sessions for you all to discuss and share and share your own ideas with this. If you'd be interested in separately to this session, kind of a, organizing a sort of Zoom round table thing of um, six or seven of us to discuss these things, then um, and please get in touch afterwards. But I'm going to give you 60 seconds now to to go over this idea, and then we're going to open up to questions. Does that sound okay? Okay, everyone. So we're going to kind of open the session up now. Uh, how do we want to do this? Do we want to use the hand raising um, function? Or if people would prefer to write in the chat, feel free to, to go ahead. Isabel, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was really interested in um, this idea of like animals as a protagonist um, and indeed like thinking that, you know, if we have an animal as a protagonist, like why are we working on like a human time scale of storytelling um, and the scale of like a lifespan and things like that? Um, I guess I have a question for you two in terms of if a publisher is um, sort of aiming to publish those narratives, my thought is that they sort of get mushed into fantasy sci-fi because you know automatically when you're working on like different lifespans 
the publishing industry would like definitions of literature would be quite small and they'd say well you know that's always fantasy even if it's like the real lifespan of a tortoise or whatever it is um and then you know how do you get people to read that um you know if they don't typically read fantasy and you as a publisher think oh it's more literary fiction um so I guess it's a tough question um but you know if, if we do these new things um then mm. it might be outside of the genres of publishing um I think that we're seeing more and more uh books that are um that are trickier or are refu refusing to be kind of boxed in, in in traditional genre boxes are doing really well in terms of sales and awards. You look at the Booker um, long lists, and I'm just trying to just trying to Google in the back in the background to get the 22 <laughs> list of, and because I'm terrible at remembering titles. But I think was... I think Pod as well was um, shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction in 20, yeah. this year. I think it was um i hear what you're saying and i don't i don't think i've got a solution to to it and how we tackle that but the a lot of the books that we've listed here as examples have done really well commercially done really well um in rewards and i think that we're seeing more um books being nominated for mainstream awards that don't really that don't really fit then you can kind of read in the industry blurbs that there you know it sort of moves between fantasy and um and, and other stuff and it's kind of um it's almost like we're following in the music industry steps of going kind of post genre that's that kind of the boundaries of genre sort of um dissolving perhaps but yeah it's i don't genre. really have a, i love it yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, and sarah we have um some questions in the chat some from Comacrest to kick us off um, they say, where does political ideology fit into this? So one could argue that big structural changes will only come from big governments. Um, so do any of these books talk about mm. big government solutions, so regulation or public ownership being needed first? So... Yeah, so there's... Oh, you go ahead. Sarah. No, go. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a kind of element in some of these ones that I've spoken about today about kind of critique of government. Um, so uh, particularly something new under the sun um, and apple siege. Um, there's a lot in there of um, kind of almost governmental control, um, still kind of drawing on those like elements of dystopia. In something new under the sun, there's a massive drought. And um, instead of trying to like change the system so that that you know climate change isn't as catastrophically bad um the government ends up creating um artificial water called like what w-a-t-r um and that ends up having really detrimental consequences throughout the text um so yeah i think that's a really interesting question about kind of those like big government solutions um being needed um I can't necessarily say like whether all these like you know we're talking about like a massive amount of various different texts that are exploring these ideas um some of them do some of them don't um but i do agree with your point that i think that that is an important thing to be aware of adam do you have anything to add um yeah that so so david king scientist he was the blair government chief scientific officer or what's his title um chief scientific advisor from 2000 to 2007 for the british government um and he said in a chat that i was in with him that there um you need both uh you need po uh, political leadership and top-down kind of ambitious government action but you also need the gra um, grassroots community-led um campaign and and individual behavior change and the two of them uh mesh so in terms of the that the, they um that you need both things and uh i can't remember what i was going to say <laughs> say following from following from that um yeah that it's like it's not a dichotomy and that the, the stories can be across both 
Um, I've seen a, another few questions in the chat, if I'm okay to pick up on them. Um, so Harriet, do you think there's a case for further contextualizing in narratives connection to the climate outside of specific publication, uh, mentioning annihilation, um, which is really interesting, Adam, because we were talking, literally mm -hmm. talking about Jeff uh, Vandermeer yesterday. Um, yeah. So Jeff Vandermeer has been very vocal about its links to a specific national park and has used its popularity to fundraise for that park and rewilding in general. Um, as in, would you say that the work doesn't end at the point of publication? Um, absolutely. Um, I think it's really interesting, actually, when sometimes a text, which might not necessarily be like very e kind of eco focused, ends up being so. Um, there was a book I read that came out like like 2011 or something and to me it read like so very climate oriented like it just felt like well this is a climate change novel and I read an interview by um the author and she was like no I never really thought about climate change when I was writing this uh, which just kind of showed that you know people can read things from text in different ways uh, but also potentially kind of un there can be an undercurrent and when someone's writing something they don't know what's what's influencing them um i would say that annihilation and a lot of jeff vandermeer's work i think that that is very much kind of related to what we're talking about today in that sense of you know um annihilation really emphasizes the kind of environmental impact and the connectivity um and then oh, adam what was the the series i was talking about yesterday the the mushroom world oh, one God. The trilogy. I can't remember if you actually told me the title. You just told me a fantastic story I about think, mushroom, mushroom, yeah. mushroom people. <laughs> I've not read them, but they're on my long to read list. I think I think it's like the Ambergris trilogy or something. Um, and it's something about kind of like interspecies mushroom entanglement, which just sounds amazing. And one of them is a mystery novel. So um, mm. that sounds, yeah, really great. So love Vandermeer. So two other things to add to that. One, um, so I think it's great if the work doesn't end to publication but it's also fine if it does it's also fine if you just want to kind of publish the work and it's and and done that i i think one of the powerful you know part of the power that we have that we have is just in in the day job of being uh publishers and working in publishing and in in developing these stories and the power is in the stories being being out in the world so brilliant if you are able to put time and resource into the into the after but just the, the work in itself um is powerful the second thing is about audience that when a text is overtly environmental or overtly climate change it kind of self-selects audience um and there's something about kind of appeal uh, accidentally appealing to the converted and preaching to the converted um and that there is there's a case for producing um, like interesting um, interesting work popular work that has these ideas woven through it but is not explicitly kind of climatey um, it doesn't need to be that these you, know, you can talk about non anthropocent non anthropocentricity is that a word <laughs> in uh, as as a theme running through your through a text without the text having a more kind of clim climate vibe to it. So I think we need the full spectrum of stuff. We need the kind of, you know, sheldrake things that are kind of so obviously about our relationship with the nat natural world through to um, uh, brain blank, but, you know, texts that just have some of these ideas embedded in them, but it's not the, it's not the central point. Yeah. Um got another question in the chat uh meg so um i'm also very interested in the idea of non-anthropocentric stories but is there a danger of misappropriation if we read stories from the perspectives of animals or natural systems written by humans do we risk viewing everything in nature as able to be contained within the human mind and in human words controlled by humans if so is there a need for non-anthropocentric stories to address this nuance and do they Meg, i think this is such an important question i'm really glad you asked it i think that's such like a a tricky kind of tangled like web of things to consider because um you know obviously in writing a story from a kind of non-human perspective you're placing that like human perspective on it it's like a human understanding of what a non-human narrative would be and I think there is a risk of you know applying anthropomorphism of, of just kind of basically being like this is a story from a rabbit's perspective but it's really just a human story as if the humans were rabbits um and i think that is something that's important to to kind of consider um in in those um in those texts um i think 
you know, one thing that I'm interested in with with the text that we've spoken to today that there's often a lot of crossover. Um, so the texts that have a non-human perspective might also experiment with form or structure or genre. Uh, I think sometimes that might be an interesting way to kind of like grapple with that question. Um, so, you know, instead of just doing kind of like a traditional, I say traditional, you know, traditional like story that has a non-human narrator, maybe there's experimentation with form or structure or language. Um, there is a an eco-poet um, who was a, a winner of a Northern Writers Award through New Writing North. And I, I went to see her speak a couple of months ago. And she said that she's working on a poem from the perspective of um, like an ecosystem, but it's all written in um, uh, punctuation, like an ecosystem of punctuation. I thought it was so fascinating and like experimental <laughs> and just such an interesting way to like think outside of like traditional um, structures. So yeah, mm. really important question. And it's something that I'm still kind of thinking on um, as I work through these ideas. So we're in the last two minutes, should we just address Nate, Nate's question and then um, and then wind things up? Is that, is that okay, Isabel? That sounds perfect. Thanks, Adam. Okay. So there's a sense that there would have to be something bad enough to make governments and corporations actually make changes. How do the more utopian narratives tend to portray those changes happening? Um, Sarah, I don't know if could you take this the post hyphen bit of that bit of that question and, and after I speak to the first bit of it. Um, so that that sense that we can't uh, we can't scare people into action. Um, that is that's something that's been demonstrated over the last few decades of of climate activism that we've kind of dis disproved this idea that you just need to have a scary enough thing for for the changes to happen. You need a more nuanced understanding of what the, um, the drivers are for individuals and and um, and institutions. Um, and I I don't believe that it's that we need um something bad enough for uh governments and corporations to make changes like the bad enough stuff is is here is is, is happened and um the generally the oil in, the um oil industry the hydro hydrocarbons industry have had scientific understanding of what's coming since i think the ninth um the 90s i think the 80s or 90s uh, when they public um secretly internally published the scientific research Kind of predicting everything that is, is unfolding so they've had the the bad enough for many decades and again that's not um that's not conspiracy theory that's documented fact that they've had those things um so there's something about understanding how change how change happens um how vast change actually happens and there's no like exact science or answer to that but it's kind of social movement and behavior change and kind of in incremental removal of barriers for people to do stuff that you make you, you try and make the changes easier for people to achieve and i would say that we're starting to we're starting to see it like this this idea that nothing's happening and there's no progress that's part of the squashing narrative and it's just not true that you know what 85 percent of um of adults in the uk now believe that climate change is real and caused by humans that's like a, that's a massive shift in the last five to ten years that it's now just an accepted fact that you're not the weird kind of hippie if you're talking about climate change at the at a social gathering that's like it's just part of the discourse action is part of the discourse that we've got um huge investment um across europe in renew in renewables energy and and um kind of in in uh transport and innovation you know these these oh, wow that's the loudest knock i've ever heard at my house sorry about that um but the changes are it's a sorry i'm rambling on i don't think it's about finding something bad enough or telling the bad enough scary enough story for change to happen change is more complex um but uh, yeah the next bit for for sarah um yeah i i mean i think Again, hard to kind of like speak about them in kind of very general terms because they're all so different and it's not necessarily like they all kind of have that same kind of timeline. Um, I wouldn't even call them all utopian as a, as a genre generally. It's just that they maybe have like utopian strands or themes like the ideas we've been thinking through. Um, in terms of like the actual kind of change, like the the one thing that I do think 
they have if they do have this kind of climate catastrophe engagement is that they they don't position the kind of climate catastrophe breakdown is like a singular event so thinking back to those like post-apocalyptic apocalyptic narratives where apocalypse is seen as one single event that like breaks the before and the after and you have to respond to that um a lot of the narratives um that we're interested in that um, depict climate change or climate catastrophe very much show that it is a slow incremental uh, well not even necessarily slow anymore but kind of like a stretched out um thing that is ongoing that has a million different causes a million different effects it's not you know one asteroid coming to um blow up the planet it, it's it's a very complex thing i think that's quite important when thinking through narrating climate catastrophe um is is being aware of all those different strands and, and grappling with that and, and just to say thanks as well to, to isabel um for organizing this it's been really great to mm -hmm. be a part of so thank you so much a pleasure um, and I should definitely say a big thank you to Common Press and Arts Council England to fund the Northern Fiction Alliance and um, this is a pilot year for the Green Book Fair um, and it's already got my brain thinking about what publishers can be doing um, within the climate change discourse so big thank you to Adam, France in the Ground and Sarah France for all your research. Um, I look forward to what you do next um, and following the, the climate change reading list that you have. Um, so for the rest of the Green Book Fair, um, I know that everyone has individual meetings today um, and tomorrow we have our showcase day. So we'll be hearing from lots of different publishers across different territories. Um, we'll be starting with New Zealand and Australia at 9am British summer time. Um, so we'll see you tomorrow um, and we'll circulate this recording um, with everyone that registered for the event, um, as well as Adam and Sarah's emails. Big thank you to everyone and have a lovely rest of the day.